I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Jesse Enkamp, known to many in the Dojoverse as the Karate Nerd. Jesse has a wonderful channel full of rich history, tips, and educational glances into the world of martial arts. Jesse reached out to me and we had a wonderful conversation about our YouTube journeys, how he transitioned from tournaments to the amazing channel that he has now, and how even we got our own start here on Art of One Dojo. So today, we're just going to share some of our conversation with you all because that's what this is. It's a platform to share ideas and our experiences. What made you decide to do that transition from tournament coverage to more educational and presentation topics like you're covering today? So it all started when I was living in Okinawa. So I went there because I wanted to learn more about karate, which I had been doing all my life since I was a kid, right? And so when you kind of grow up, you have to decide what, what to do with your life, right? So I decided, well, I want to go mm -hmm. deeper into this karate thing because I've been doing it all my life anyway, since both of my parents are my teachers and I grew up in the dojo. So I moved to Okinawa and while I was there, I experienced so many different and weird, unique cultural things that I decided to just start sharing them online with people through something called blogging, which was the new thing back then, right? And so what I did was I started a blog and I just shared my experiences and observations from living in Okinawa, you know, uh, going to find a, a an old master's gravesite or practicing with that dude over there. And these things that I would have loved to read about myself if I wasn't in Okinawa, right? As a karate nerd. And so that started to resonate with a lot of people who didn't have the ability to go to Okinawa, who didn't have the same connections or influences that I had. And so gradually I built a community around this whole journey of exploring the art. And these people are known as karate nerds, right? And so from there, people started asking me to also post videos. And that's why I started doing more tutorials, teaching some stuff that I had learned and gradually I got more and more requests. And then I kind of thought it was a fun way to share knowledge because text or blogging is kind of a, there's a separation between you and the audience. There's a wall of text, right? And it's mm -hmm. fine to begin with because it's a safe way to express yourself. You can always go back and edit things. But when a video is out there, it's you looking into the camera and everybody's seeing you and there's nothing to hide behind. And you can't really go back and edit a video. When it's out there, it's out there, right? So that was mm -hmm. kind of the gradual next step because I'm not a naturally extroverted person. I, I always love to read and write and kind of be on my own. And that's why writing or blogging was the best way for me to start sharing my observations and experiences. And the next step after that if, is of course in real life, right? Doing seminars, which is what I started doing mm -hmm. afterwards. And I still remember my very first international seminar because I'd been teaching since I was a kid in our dojo, right? So teaching a class mm -hmm. is not a problem, but I'd never taught in English because it's my third language. And I never thought, taught outside of my own dojo. So in 2014, I decided to do the Karate Nerd Experience where I wanted to invite some really awesome instructors as an excuse to learn from them myself, right? And then I got a bunch of dedicated karate nerds from 25 different countries attending this very first uh, seminar. And I still remember, I didn't know, like, should I say punch, strike or hit? Cause I, you know, it's just, <laughs> I had never even thought about these things. I was so nervous before I taught that. And now today I've taught seminars in 19 countries. And I, I know, and I traveled a lot before that competing, you know, with the national team and stuff. So I've been to a lot of countries, but you know, from, it always kind of uh, escalates or progresses once you reach a new um, kind of milestone all the time. And that's the way I try to see my work is always kind of growing and expanding, going outside right. of the comfort zone. Yeah, exactly. 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 Once you, step, once you step out far enough, that becomes your new comfort zone. You got to keep pushing it outward. Exactly. Right. Yeah. How about yourself? How did you get into the whole YouTube space? Well, it's funny. Um, we have uh, my, my friend, Zach, he's actually on the channel as White Bell Zach sometimes. Uh, we have been running our own video production company for about 22 years now. We met in, in hall, um, college and we just started working videos. We started doing freelance work. And several years ago, we were looking into um, YouTube marketing as, a, as a, like an advertising platform. And we wanted to put together a service. So we went to my, uh, my instructor at the time. He had a school and we're like, hey, you want to help us this you know we'll give you a whole bunch of free videos you know like short little one minute videos and we'll film them and we'll, we'll release them and see if we can promote your school we wanted to test the process yeah and we went to a school and we did like 30 to 40 videos 
each day. So we had wow. ended up after two days of shooting, we had like 60 videos. They're super <laughs> short. Yeah. I, I kind of, looking back now, I kind of cringe like, oh, we weren't really prepared. He wasn't prepared. We hit him with a question like, we know what's the history of MMA that he tried to sum up in one minute. Uh -huh. So like, there's a lot of information left out, but it was sort of a platform test. And we released, you know, a couple videos a week for a while. And it built a little bit of momentum. He got a little bit of business out of it. We're like, okay, this is great. We want to keep building this. And then uh, about two years into the project, he decided that he wanted to close the school and move to North Carolina. And we're mm -hmm. like, oh, oh, okay, well, there went that project. But, <laughs> but we you know we got to play around with it. We saw how it worked. And then we, let the, we just let it sit for a while. And we noticed over the course of the year or two, it was still getting a little bit of traffic. And there were trolls that were jumping on there, but certain videos we saw out of the 60 videos there were like four that were like surging and we're like, okay, this, there's still something here. There's some momentum here. And we just watched it and people were asking for more content that were like, all right, maybe we should turn this into something. Yeah. And it was one of those things that we kind of talked about. It was in the background for the longest time. And then in 2018, uh, my father passed away and it was kind of like a lot of things came to a halt, you know, we kind of stopped the business for a little bit. And as we were picking back up, um, I realized, you know what, I need to get myself back to the martial arts because I've, I've trained on and off a, for the, about 28 years myself. And during his time of the sickness, I didn't really focus on it. So I'm like, you know what, I want to step outside my boundaries. Like you said, I want to see what's outside my local village. Yeah. So I looked into some judo schools and I found a, a really good uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu school here in my town, met with the Shihan wonderful guy he sat down with me we talked for about an hour let me he let me try class and i fell in love with it and it but that culture shock was there i'm like wow this is so different than what i trained in this is so i mean there's there's similarities but the, the whole dynamic is different so i got really interested in, in expanding my own horizon so we started to just do um, a bunch of little topics and we we're like why don't we restart the channel and we, we rebranded it and the funny thing is we kind of tried to keep on the same content my instructor had which was based on parents looking for schools, kids going to the martial arts, you know, how to find a school. And we did a bunch of videos like that. And as we started to release them, we realized that wasn't our audience. The people who are watching were other martial artists, more serious martial artists, and they were asking questions. And I'm like, oh, this is not, these are not parents watching our show. This is, these are people looking for real, real information. So we had to kind of stop and regroup and did a bunch of research and just talked to a bunch of people and realized that, that the world of martial arts was way broader and richer than we ever thought. Yeah. And the more we got into it and then we started doing topics for fun. Like I've got my whole Karate Kid series that I'm just totally obsessed with, but right. we threw fun <laughs> stuff out there, but we saw that people were starting to connect with the material. So basically we kind of watched where people were flowing and we're like, well, let's make material for that for that group because they seem to be the ones liking it. Yeah, I, I always str struggle with that. Like, so there are two paths you can take with content creation. You can make the stuff that people want to see, or mm -hmm. you can make the stuff that you want to create. And they're not always the same, right? Because a lot of people right. want to learn like, let's say, uh, you know, beginner tutorials, how to tie your belt or how to make a fist. But if I wanted to do just what people wanted to see, then I would kind of focus more on those types of videos. But there's al mm -hmm. always the other path of like, if you consider yourself more of an, an artist that kind of creating something that people don't even know that they actually want to see kind of that's yeah. what henry ford said like if if i just gave people what they wanted we would just have faster horses and not cars i don't know how you view that but kind of I'm no i agree with that i see I, I took it as a challenge because the stuff the, the material that people were asking for we weren't quite 100 percent prepared on like they were asking for a lot of art history i'm like okay we need to do a lot of research before we start putting that stuff out yeah. um i still found a way to throw in the stuff i wanted to talk about but then we tried to explore like i started to listen like people's comments yeah. uh people started asking me advice like hey i'm really short what, what's the best art for me or i'm getting picked on at school what's the best art for me and it's like well, we started realizing there's people out there who have a lot of challenges. There's disabilities, yes. there's learning issues. There's people who can't find a school, their school shut down. Um, I have a history of, you know, I, my school changed so many times, two different instructors, like probably six different locations. We kept changing the curriculum. So I understand a lot of the struggles yeah. students can go into. So we're like, well, why don't we dive into some of that? So we're, we do try a mixture, you know, people want art history. We, we put those out when we can, mm. uh, we do some fun stuff when we can, but then we try to do a lot of, well, this is the challenge a lot of people face. How would you overcome it? Well, here's our perspective. This yeah. is what we did. Here's the people we talked to. So yeah, I agree with you. There's there's a lot of topics people want to see. Yeah. And there's the stuff that you want to do, but I definitely think there's a kind of a, a middle area where you kind exactly. of mix and match them together. That's what you want to find, right? Mm. What would you say is the number one challenge that people seem to have? Some question you get a lot. A lot of age related. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of we have a lot of older martial artists. People are like, 
It's funny because I get people in their 40s and 50s ask me, is it too late to start? Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. But I get the same question from 15-year-olds. Like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. There's always something you can get out of it. It's so weird. Uh, we a lot of sometimes I get questions from like somebody who's like 75. And honestly, I don't know. I haven't been 75 yet. I'll tell you when I get there, but I don't think yeah. it's too late. I mean, what do you no, think? I, well, here's how I look at it. No matter, okay, if you're 75, you're not going to be going, jumping into tournaments or competing. But right. who is to say you can't learn one or two things that could help yourself to defend yourself? Yeah. Or if you fall, you may even, even learn how to fall properly could save your life. Exactly. Or if someone does grab you, you can just get, get the grab off. Or just, just health in general and the interaction. Right. There's so many... I, I, we had one guy come into the jujitsu class and he was probably around 70, 75. And I'm like, I give you credit, dude, because he was doing the falls. Uh, and after a while, it got to be too much for him. I'm like, I yeah. give you credit for trying because that's, yeah. that's rough to start at that age. But yeah. no, I, I don't, I think regardless of whatever age it is, as long as the person speaks for the doctor, I think there's always some sort of benefit they can get out of training the martial arts, regardless what it is, whether it be grappling or boxing or whatever, they find what's right for them. There's a lot of low impact arts if they're, exactly. if they have injuries, but. Maybe the problem is that they compare themselves too much with others. I think they so. expect to be able and to it, perform like a 25 year old. I don't know. Well, there's a lot of stigma out there too, because there are people I have had pe viewers say like, Oh, if once you press the age of 40, you don't belong on the mat. I'm like, well, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's your perspective. But there's, I, I know I've, I have sparred 60 year olds that have kicked my butt. So yeah. I know for a fact, the age of 40 is not a cutoff. Mm -hmm. Right. There is this uh, Chinese saying. I think it's a Chinese saying that the best, What's, what's the saying? The best time to plant a tree was yesterday, but the second best time is now. I right? like that. Yeah, like yeah. That. we'll see. Maybe, I, maybe I'll be super stiff and, and weak one day. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. But. yeah, but then we look at someone like Superfoot Bill Wallace and he's still, yeah, he's still kicking. He's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Have you heard about his diet? His diet? No. Milkshakes and hamburgers. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was a joke when he told me because I invited him as a guest to teach at my uh, KNX uh, seminar and we, it, we filmed two videos, but he also did an interview, you know, uh, for the participants, uh, kind of Q&A thing. And he honestly, he said that his diet is hamburgers and milkshakes. He said it greases his joints and that's why it's so, he's so flexible. <laughs> I could see him saying that. He was, see, uh, he, I, and, and he got upset when we thought he was joking. <laughs> I mean, well, he doesn't kid around like that. <laughs> he's a he's a very straight shooter. <laughs> he is, he is. So maybe I think maybe it's uh, something with his genetics also, because other people on a, on a fast food diet they would just break down. <laughs> yeah, but he also doesn't stop training. Like, um, he, he told me one day in an interview, he goes, "Look, he goes, I keep moving because he goes, if I stop, I die." So yeah. he posts stuff on Facebook all the time. He's always doing classes. He's always teaching. He's still doing seminars, and he's yeah. still really fast. Exactly. So yeah. whatever he's doing is working for him. For sure. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> he's like a shark. You know, if they stop moving, they, they die. I think, I believe some of the first videos of yours I saw were your um, trips to Okinawa, which I found were absolutely fascinating. And yeah. um, I know you went to China as well. I haven't had a chance to see those, but just seeing you actually going around and, and you didn't just do a tour, but you actually got into the culture and you showed how each dojo operated. And it was such a eye-opening experience to see how different martial arts training is across the world that that got me hooked on your channel right away and, and your material was fantastic so um i love that you did stuff like that and then just how you bring different um techniques and where the history comes from and you know misconceptions and with your brother being in the mma i think that the the mix of pers um, perspectives that you have is really rich and yes. you've actually inspired me a lot of just kind of directions i want to go and how i want to present to people because your material is out there and i think it's one of the better channels honestly in the martial arts yeah i hope that i can inspire people because honestly just putting yourself out there is pretty it's pretty scary to begin with but uh, it is <laughs> i mean i don't think you have to be an expert or a master at anything at all and i definitely don't consider myself i don't even call myself a sensei but but others do but but still, just putting yourself out there, that's the scary part. But you don't have to see the whole staircase to help somebody take a step. You just have to be one step ahead of them, right? And exactly. actually, I think it's a shame because there are so many people out there with awesome knowledge, like world champions and experts and professors, but they never share what they know because they don't like, for instance, that internet trolls can criticize you uh, super easily, right? 
And so I always try to find these golden nuggets, these people with super high level uh, proficiency or expertise, and then try to extract some knowledge from them and then try to share that with as, as many people as possible. I'd like to extend a great big thank you to Jesse Sensei for your time and sharing your journey with us. Now, if any of you out there have not seen this channel, then I cannot recommend it enough, and you can find it in the link in the description down below. Also, be sure to join us in the next episode when we continue this conversation and we talk about our experiences exploring other arts outside of our own. Thank you so much for watching.